This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. Once again, Ben, another great guest today. We had Professor Moja Malewski, who uh, basically lives at the intersection of wealth management, financial mathematics, insurance, retirement income planning, well-known name to, I'm sure, many, many listeners, and... Uh, This is quite an interview. Yeah, it is quite an interview. Um, Professor Malevsky's written a ton of books, uh, 16 books, and he talks at the very end of the episode about the next book that he's probably going to write, which sounds fascinating. I won't spoil spoil what it is. Uh, We we framed this, most of this discussion around one of his books, which happens to be his best-selling book, uh, which is about the, the seven equations that you need for your retirement. So we had, we had, uh, I thought a pretty good discussion framed around each of those, uh, questions, those, those, those retirement equations. Yeah. I, I've been a big fan of his work for a long time. I don't think there's any book I've given out more than his book. Are you a stock or a bond or the other one pensionize your nest egg, which he co-authored with, uh, past guest Alexander McQueen. And those two books are, are phenomenal. So I was, uh, Pleasantly surprised that he had a book that sold better than that one, which is what we built mostly the interview around. Um, professor Malewski is the finance professor at the Schulich School of Business at York University. He earned a bachelor's of physics from Yeshiva University and his master's in mathematics and stats at York University and his PhD in finance from York University's Schulich School of Business as well. And his his most recent book is Retirement Income Recipes in R, which just as a point of of uh, interest, people know from past podcast episodes that we've we've hired Braden Warwick, who is uh, proficient in I mean more than proficient he was teaching Python. Uh, I don't know what you call that. Is he an expert? He's he's very very good at at Python. R is similar to Python. And so it, one of the things that we're looking at with, with Braden is Moshe's most recent book on uh, retirement recipes in R. So that kind of kind of ties, ties some past conversations into this. Anyways, it's a uh, an incredible amount of brain power. And I just loved how he made things, many of his answers, just so pragmatic. And you can tell he has so much experience, so much practical, brilliant experience. And he made uh, made some uh, pieces of advice based on solid math, but also just pragmatic experience of teaching and working with people for many, many years in this field. Yeah, that's it. So I think it was a, it was a great conversation. It was it was uh, like you said, Cameron, high energy, a little bit a little bit fast paced, but I thought it was excellent, excellent content. So with that, here's Professor Moja Malewski. Moshe Malewski, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thank you. My first question, you've got a book on the seven most important equations in retirement. Um, and so I think this is a fitting first question because you're known as the, the retirement quant. So what are they? What are the most important retirement equations? All right. So the, the book is called The Seven Most Important Equations for Your Retirement. Uh, it was published eight years ago. Uh, I am uh, quite uh, happy that this book has done uh, as well as it has. Um, I'm, I'm honored that you're asking me to talk about this book, this one book, uh, as opposed to you know the 15 other ones. Uh, there are seven equations in the book. The first equation has to do uh, with uh, the longevity of your money. Uh, the equation, uh, I call it the Fibonacci equation. Uh, it's an equation or a formula that maps uh, how much money you have, uh, how much you're spending, how much you're withdrawing, and the rate you're earning on that money, it maps it or it uh, equates it with a time horizon. How long before you go broke? So if I am retired and I'm pulling out you know, $50,000 a year from my RRSP and I have a half a million in the RRSP and my RRSP is earning 4%, uh, I'm obviously withdrawing much more than I'm earning. I'm withdrawing principal this thing will eventually deplete itself and hit zero. And how long will that be? 
And the first of the seven equations uh, tells us the number of years that that will uh, take place. And I trace the formula of the equation back to uh, Fibonacci. Uh, he was a you know well-known middle e uh, medieval, maybe even early modern uh, arithmetician. He wrote a book called Libera Baki. He's also known for the Fibonacci series. And, uh, you know, in one of his many writings, he, he wrote down an equation for present value or methodology for present value. So I named the equation after him. So that is the first uh, of the seven. So let's see, what did I put as number two? Ah, yes. Uh, the, uh, how long someone will live. So uh, one of the uh, many conversations that you tend to have with clients, uh, with people, uh, when they are retired, uh, is how long they should plan for. So, uh, you know, just in my own life, my mom retired, you know, five or six years ago from her job. She lives in Baltimore in the U.S. And, you know, during one of our many conversations, she said to me, you know, Moshe, I'm not working anymore. Uh, I don't much, I don't have much of a pension. You know, she doesn't have a defined benefit pension. She has a little bit of CPP that she receives. Uh, she said, how long is my money going to last? So I said, oh, that's equation number one. That's Mr. Fibonacci. I can show you that. And her second question was, okay, how long am I going to last? I know how long the money's going to last. Thank you, Mr. Fibonacci. But how long am I going to last? And of course, I told my mother, God bless her. I hope you last forever. Right. We obviously want you to last forever, uh, but that's obviously not realistic. Human beings have a finite lifetime. Uh, on average, how long? Uh, what's the standard deviation? What's the dispersion there? So there's this very well-known uh, British or English mathematician. His name is uh, Benjamin Gompertz. He lived in the uh, 18th century and uh, sorry, that would be in the 19th century. And uh, he, he was sort of one of the first actuaries in the UK, and he came up with an equation to sort of model how long people live. So it's called the Gompertz equation. Uh, it maps your current age, which is obviously very important. You know, the older you are, the less time you have. Uh, it uh, takes into account the mean, how long on average people live, the standard deviation, and it turns into some sort of probability. Why is this an important equation? Uh, because when someone says to me, what are the odds I'll live to 100? Or what are the odds I'll live to 95? Or what are the odds I'll live to 80? Uh, Mr. Gompertz's equation is the first equation that we would pull out to give a sense of what that number is going to be. Uh, it's the bread and butter of actuaries. So that's the second equation in the book uh, for retirement. All right. Now, on this one, I'm going to I'm going to introduce one of your other more more recent books. Yeah, I can't remember the, the title, uh, but the, it's about biological age. I have it somewhere behind me. Uh, okay. Can you so just, what about biological age? Yeah, go since ahead. We're on I, question I really number... do hope this isn't a one hour monologue. I can do those. So yes, ask a question, please. <laughs> So since we're on this on this question number two about about how how long you're going to live and there's a there's a mathematical answer to that, uh, can can you can you just speak a little bit a little bit about the the more recent research on the difference between your chronological age and how that relates to the data and your biological age? I'd be delighted to. I'd be delighted to. So let let's take a tangent and let's talk about uh, biological age. So. Um, when we talk about age, uh, you know, in financial planning, age is central to everything. It's part of knowing your client. How old is your client? How old is the spouse? You know, when are they going to retire? So age is central to financial planning. Asset allocation models are geared to age. Oh, you're 40. You should have this amount of stock. Oh, you're 80. You should have that amount of stock. So, you know, age is everywhere. You can't do financial planning without age, right? Now, what does age mean? Age is, you know, the number of years since you were born, uh, the uh, number of times you circled the sun, you know, that's chronological age, which, you know, is pretty easy to do. Uh, it's very easy to measure. We've been measuring it for, you know, hundreds, possibly thousands of years. The problem is, is that number is a very imprecise measure of how long we're going to live. We're using age because what we really want to know is how long are you going to live? We don't know how long you're going to live. It's random, as Mr. Gompertz taught us. So we do the second best, which is chronological age. And we kind of use that as a proxy for how long I have left. Oh, you're 60. So, you know, 90 minus 60 is 30. The problem is, is that there is a growing body of research, and this has been going on for a long time, that seems to indicate that chronological age is not a very good measure of how long you're going to live. And that there's another much, much better metric out there that uh, the medical community has come up with or the gerontologists, biologists have come out with called biological age. And, you know, I can talk for an entire hour about how one would go about measuring biological age, but it's basically a better sense of how old your body really is. 
And the data seems to indicate that, you know, you can be 65 years old chronologically, 65 chronologically, but your biological age is closer to, you know, 50. You're 15 years younger than your chronological age. Uh, you know, intuitively, what that means is you look at them and you say, no, you're not 65. You can't be a day over 50. <laughs> and then we say, wow, you re really look good for your age. No, 65 isn't their age. Your biological age is 50. Right. It's not just you look good. You're just not that age. Vice versa. We've all met people uh, that are 65 years old chronologically. And sadly, they're you know, they don't look 65. They look 80 or 75. And what we would say is, no, their biological age is 75. So the dispersion in biological age uh, can be as much as 20 years. You know, you can be 20 years older than your chronological age. You can be 20 years younger than your chronological. True age can be, you know, plus or minus 20 years. Why is this relevant to financial planning? Because our entire pension and retirement system is geared to chronological age. Oh, you're 70 and a half. Well, now it's time to do this. Oh, you're 67. Well, now you can do that. Or, oh, you're 62. You might want. That's all chronological. Biologically, you can have a completely different age. So the discussion that, you know, we were having earlier about the equations and retirement are all nice and well when all you know is your chronological age. But once somebody gives me a little bit more information about biological age, uh, this is a different conversation. And what I'm advocating is it's time to learn more about biological age. Uh, when you do retirement planning, stop asking your clients for their chronological age or start by asking that uh, get a sense of their biological age. Financial plans have to be geared to both of them. And uh, you, you got to build asset allocation models and spending and drawdown plans that take account biological age and chronological age. That's sort of the, you know, the elevator version, very long elevator ride, but elevator version. <laughs> So we called that a tangent, but I, I think it actually brought us to the chapter three of your book. If you if you if you look at the book, you'll you'll see the uh, the, the next chapter is on annuities and whether or not they make sense. So maybe we can talk about about that equation, about that chapter of the book, but then also tie it back to how it relates to biological age. Sure. Um, so, you know, amongst the you know seven calculations, I think every retirement planner should know how to do. Uh, you know, we talked longevity of the portfolio, longevity of human life. Uh, the third one would be how to value a pension annuity, how to value a life annuity. Uh, most people get to retirement and they have to decide uh, whether or not to take a lump sum or to take an annuity. Now, even if you're not part of a defined benefit plan, uh, if you're part of a defined contribution plan, you still have to decide whether to take that money and buy an annuity. So you may not think you have the choice of whether to take the annuity. You always do because you can always convert it into an annuity. Uh, the process of converting a sum of money into an annuity or a stream of income into a sum of money uh, requires some sort of equation. And I call that uh, Haley's equation. Uh, Edmund Halley or Haley, depending on what side of the Atlantic you're on, was an astronomer. Uh, he was uh, very well known for the, being the father of Halley's Comet, uh, but he actually did quite a lot of interesting work in many other fields, including actuarial science. And he was, for most actuaries, unless you're Dutch, they think it was someone else, but for most actuaries, uh, he was uh, the person uh, that came up with the first equation to value uh, an annuity. So I, I think it's an important one. It's one of the seven. If you claim to be a retirement income planner, you should know a little bit about that equation. Even though you have no idea how to do it yourself, you have a black box called spreadsheet that does it for you. You should know a little bit about how that works. So how important is it for retirees to give annuities more respect with some of their financial assets? Yeah, so you don't have to give an annuity any respect at all. I, I don't think you have to respect the things you own, uh, but you do have to give it some consideration, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of annuity income already. So uh, I, I have exhausted this analogy to death, but I like to think of it as zinc. Uh, you know, everybody needs to have a little bit of zinc in their diet. If you talk to a, a dietitian or a, someone who specializes in nutrition, uh, they'll say, yeah, you know, everybody has to have zinc. Uh, the question is, how much do you need? Uh, you measure it in, you know, milligrams. Uh, and if you go, uh, you know, many, many months without any zinc at all, there's going to be a zinc deficiency that's going to affect you. Vice versa, you take a big spoonful of zinc, it'll probably kill you. So everybody should have a little bit of it. The question becomes with annuities, using the zinc analogy, how much should you have? So it's not a question of whether you should have it or not. Everybody should have some zinc. 
It's a question of how much is too much and how much is too little. So to answer your question, Cameron, if you happen to be a teacher or a police officer or a fireman or a federal or provincial employee, and you retire with a wonderful defined benefit pension, you know, gold plated pension, and your spouse happens to also be a public servant, and they're entitled to a lovely, wonderful defined benefit pension to pension income. And uh, you happen to have a little bit of money in an RRSP, uh, or you have to have a little bit of money in a TFSA or taxable account. And somebody comes and says to you, hey, you should consider buying an annuity. Professor Malevsky said it's a good thing. Run the other way because you already have a lot of annuity income. You don't anymore. You will overdose on zinc. Don't buy any more annuity. Vice versa, in the other direction, if you happen to be approaching retirement, and you have uh, no zinc in your diet, you have no annuity income, you don't have a DB plan, you're part of a money purchase plan, and your spouse has a money, and you're sitting on a million, two million, three million, whatever the numbers, and it's all in liquid investable assets, stocks, bonds, cash, commodities, alternatives, and you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I make my money last as long as I live? I would say, you know, you might want to consider some sort of annuity product. Now, how much, at what age, what type of annuity, inflation adjustment, inflation, yeah. go talk to, Cameron and Benjamin, they'll tell you which one, but that's sort of the, the, the summary. So, so let's link the annuity decision back to your discussion on biological age. Do insurance companies look at your biological age or is this something you can use to your advantage in choosing if and when and how much to purchase into an annuity? Right, so, so Cameron, that's a great question. The, the first part of the question is, do insurance companies know about biological age? And the answer is absolutely they do, they just don't call it that. They, they don't use that term. That term comes from the medical field. They use terms like age setbacks and underwriting and preferred health and, 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 and you know, and then substandard health. So they're aware of the fact vaguely that some people are much healthier than their age and some people are less healthy than their age. And they've got all these actual ways of biological age, which I can explain to my mother. Right. I don't want to sit and explain to my mother actuarial setbacks on mortality tables. <laughs> oh, mom, see, this is QX. And then you set it back seven years and you invert the QX. And that no, that's not going to work. Mom, what's your biological age? Did you get tested? Here's the telomere tested. So in some sense, insurance companies are aware of it. And some insurance companies are saying we want to use that information when we price annuities and we price insurance. And regulators are saying, oh, no, 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 no. You can't use that genetic information or that, uh, you know, biochemical information. Uh, and they're saying, why not? Well, we should be entitled to. Otherwise, people are going to anti-select on us. They're going to come into our shop knowing that their biological age is 30 and they're going to buy stuff from us without disclosing their biological. So it's a huge area. And, you know, we can spend the next hour talking about that. But the short answer <laughs> to your question is insurance companies certainly do know about this concept. And what what about using it to your advantage, though? So I, I would, you know, I. Uh, I mean, I took one of these tests, but, you know, this is not about me. You can use this to your advantage. And if it comes back with a number that's very low, you know, say, for example, let's say you're 65 and you take one of these telomere tests or DNA methylation tests or you name it. And, and, and the test comes back, hey, Matt, wow, you're in great shape. I mean, you're 45. You're indistinguishable from a 45 year old. What? Really? But my birthday was 65. Yes. No, you're 45. I am 20 years younger than my chronological age. Yes. I would run to the insurance company to buy an annuity. I mean, I, I would sprint, right? I'm a young guy, right? I would sprint <laughs> to the insurance company because I, I would anti-select. Now, do I have to disclose it at this point? I don't have to. Vice versa in the other direction. Uh, I am 70 years old and I'm trying to figure out, I don't know, riff, not riff. Do I convert it to an annuity? And uh, I go and I do this test and the test comes back and says, you're 70, but you know, according to this test, you're off the charts, you're three digits. You're a centenarian, my friend. What do you mean? But I turned 70. Oh, that's chronologically. Your biological age is 100. I I'm not buying an annuity because the annuity is about pooling risk with all the people that live along. The so it is a piece of information that would be relevant. Of course, I'm, you know, I'm exaggerating. You know, the gap isn't going to be 30 years. What if, what if the age is exactly 70? But what I'm trying to say is take into account your health status, your biological age, whatever, before you buy any life contingent claim, especially when it's what's an annuity. But to sort of get up and declare everybody should buy annuities and, you know, everybody should have 90% in annuities. And that, no, come on, that, that's simplistic. It's ridiculous.
unless you're an annuity salesman and everything you see can be solved with an annuity. <laughs> if we take that case of biological age equaling chronological age, just to take the, the, the biological age decision point out of it, is there an optimal age that people should be thinking about annuitizing? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to quibble with your statement that, you know, assuming that you're by, it, it mathematically is impossible, right? I mean, it's a knife's edge. You can't get the same number and there's a margin of uncertainty over it. Uh, but, you know, assuming that hypothetical, so we're all dancing on the, uh, you know, pins, top of pins of angels or whatever the analogy is. Uh, I would say that before the age of 60, I wouldn't even talk about it. Because for the annuity, and I'm talking about the traditional annuity. I'm not talking about things that are masquerading as annuities that have nothing to do with annuities. I'm not talking about the legal annuity. I'm talking about the economic annuity. Before the age of 60, you know, it's hard to justify the mortality credits or the pooling or the longevity pooling. Uh, maybe if you buy it before 60 and it starts paying out at an advanced stage, these in the U.S., they're known as deferred annuities or deferred income annuities. Makes sense. But, you know, you don't turn this thing on at a young age. There's no pooling. It makes sense, especially in a low interest rate environment. That interest rates over time head up, you know, will be cycling up and down. So uh, uh, the, the short answer is not when you're young. You mentioned something that I want to dig into a little bit more. And we're still on, uh, what are we on, chapter three? We're still going to come back to the rest of the chapters in the book. Uh, <laughs> but this is, a, this is a good a good tangent we're still on with uh, with annuities. So you, you mentioned the the economic annuity versus the legal annuity. So we're, we're in, we're in Canada. You're in, you're in Canada. What do you think of the annuity product landscape here in Canada? Can you get close to the economic annuity with the products that exist here? So, I mean, you know, that's, that's a loaded question. I'm not complaining about the existence of annuity products here. Uh, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, looking at it from an international perspective, I have a lot more choices elsewhere. So it's a little bit disappointing that we don't have a more robust uh, selection of economic annuities uh, in Canada. Uh, you know, I'll give, give you one example. Um, you know, they're in, in the U.S., our cousins to the south, there is something called a variable annuity with a guaranteed minimum income benefit or a variable annuity with a guaranteed lifetime withdrawal benefit. Um, these are products are, you know, used to be available in Canada. Some companies ran into trouble. There are some companies that offer them, but they're not as, as you know, certainly not as lucrative as they are uh, in, in the U.S. The equity indexed annuities completely don't exist. Variable income annuities don't exist. Deferred income annuities don't exist. So, you know, the shelf is a little bit empty. I, I, you know, it's like going to a 7-Eleven versus Metro. You know, there's not that many uh, annuity products out there. That said, if you want a single premium income annuity, you know, you, you can buy it. There are, you know, five or six insurance companies that quote liquid prices for it. So, you know, it, it's available. But, you know, there are other products uh, that are available uh, elsewhere that uh, are slightly better. And uh, part of it is the tax story. So, I, you know, I haven't mentioned the word tax in the 20 minutes we've been chatting. Tax is obviously a very, very critical component of retirement income planning, and uh, keeping your assets tax sheltered for as long as possible is, you know, obviously very intuitive and very important. And the annuity products in Canada don't have the same type of beneficial tax treatments that we see in the U.S. So you can dump money into a policy and it grows tax sheltered, like really like an RRSP. Uh, you don't have that here. There's an exclusion and inclusion ratio on single premium income annuities that are not registered, but uh, Again, it's not as beneficial to be in the States. So I'm probably rambling at this point all about no, no. zinc, but that, no, those yeah. are my thoughts. But there, there's a couple more points on zinc that, that I want to that I want to touch on because I think this is important. And I, I know you've, you've talked about other on other podcasts being pigeonholed as the zinc guy. So I don't want to make you the zinc guy. We're going to talk about other stuff. But I, I have I have I think I think there's one more thing I want to touch on here. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned the product landscape in Canada being being relatively small or, or un, undiverse in, in terms of annuities. Uh, annuities are hard to sell. We, we use a tool called Prari, um, which is a tool that you were involved with developing that shows mathematically with st stochastic uh, modeling why the, the annuity makes sense. We've shown this to people, getting them to actually write the check to purchase the annuity. And we don't we don't care. Like we, we probably make more in terms of our revenue off of managing assets than we do off annuity commission. So there's no incentive for us. But people don't want to write the check. So if you're if you're making the pitch to, to get someone to purchase an annuity, how do you how do you approach it? Do you want me to sell you an annuity? Please, please sell me an annuity. 
Look, uh, thankfully, I'm not a financial advisor or a financial planner. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night with that responsibility. I don't know how you guys sleep at night. Every billions of dollars relying on you, I, you know. It's stressful. For me, it would be, be difficult. To be honest with you. It, it, <laughs> it, it is. It, it's not it, easy. It, it's not easy, and so you know, simply because of what you've described, you know, in order to eat, you've got to sell things. Right? You know, you gotta you gotta kill something to eat it. So, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of killing things. So I, I, it's hard to sell an annuity. Uh, what I would say is, as I mentioned 10 minutes ago, if you don't have any guaranteed income for the rest of your life, you might want to consider some because everybody should have some form of guaranteed income. Uh, but, you know, many of these people look at the stock market and say, yeah, but, you know, markets go up 8, 10, 15 percent a year. Why would I lock in this pithy thing if I can make so much money in the stock market? So you got to educate them about the risk in the stock market. So this obviously would be a very different conversation if we were doing this in March, you know, back when the markets were down 30 percent and we were back to 10 year old prices. Uh, maybe it would be easier to sell an annuity. And in fact, there's very interesting research here we go. This is all going to be about zinc for the next hour. There's very interesting research that shows that when you give people a choice between an annuity and a lump sum. So I think this was a study that was done by IBM a few years ago. IBM had this you know, wonderful defined benefit pension plan for, for decades and decades. And they were tracking how many people got to retirement at IBM and took the annuity, meaning income for the rest of their life as long as they live, and how many came to IBM's HR department and said, no, 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 I don't want that. Give me the money. Give me the money. How many took the lump sum? How many took the annuity? Which is sort of the opposite of what you're saying. I don't want to cut a check. Well, I, I'd rather have the check. So, and it turns out they were trying to correlate it with <laughs> demographic factors. So they wanted to see, are, are the males taking the cash and the females taking the annuity? No, nah, that, that wasn't. W was it the people that were the engineers that took the annuity because they're the smart ones, but the non engine Nah. What did they correlate it? What stuck? Where did they get a statistically given correlation? How did the stock market do in the six months before the decision? If markets were up very, very strongly before they wandered into the HR department to talk Some about it, money. like, of course, I want to take the money. I, I, I want to play in that casino. I was doing so well. Oh, markets were down for six. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want more money. Give me an income. Give me an income. So, you know, that's interesting. Th that's it. So the reason you're having a tough time pitching it is because, you know, for all intents and purposes, we're in one of the longest bull markets in history. People, you know, stop believing the markets could go down for, you know, extended period of time. They really think the Bank of Canada, the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank will bail us all out. And they look at anything that's sort of downside protected and income and like, nah, I don't need that. So we have to wait for so, a bear market to, to convince people that annuities make sense. You know, or you might have more success or you might, you know, it, to me, it's about disclosure. You know, that I, that's why I said earlier, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I had this job. To me, it's about, look, I want you to sign that I told you about this. That's the way I look at it. I, I need you to, you know, to confirm that I've explained to you some of the risks that you're running. Uh, and, 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 you know, and then you do whatever you want, you know, as long as you pay me, of course, but you can do whatever you want, but I need disclosure that, that, you know, that you, that you were told about this. And, and I think that that's the way the insurance conversation has to go. You know, I, I get contacted by a lot of advisors and it's not just about annuities. You know, it's about long term care insurance, it's about critical illness insurance, it's about life insurance. Like, Moshe, how do we sell more CI or how do we sell more? I said, what do you walk this to me? Well, I keep on telling the client they don't listen. All right. Get it in writing and move on. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know, what else can you do? I mean, it's, it's physicians, you know, look, I told you to stop smoking. I told it's in the file. I told you to stop. So I think that's the approach you have to take as opposed to kind of insisting, you know, oh, well, if you, if you don't buy the annuity, I'm going to leave you. I'm, I'm going to go work with someone else. And that's not the way the conversation goes. Yeah, it's good. So pragmatic that, that's advice. the way I position it. Yeah. Anyway, my thoughts. So let's bounce back to chapter four, which I believe is on proper spending rates. Yeah. So there, so, you know, the, the book, I didn't realize I'd be talking so much about the book. The book really is about people, not necessarily about equations. It's about the seven people that develop these seven equations that I think are important. So the conversation shifts to uh, this fellow called Irving Fisher. Uh, Irving Fisher was an economist uh, at the very beginning of the uh, 20th century. 
Uh, he was a professor at Yale, you know, very charismatic fellow. Um, and uh, he was one of the first economists to rigorously determine how much people should spend at retirement. Uh, many people think that spending in retirement uh, began in the 1990s. No, the idea of how much to spend in retirement has been something that economists have struggled with for a long time. And in my mind, the first person that really looked at it carefully was this fellow called uh, Irving Fisher. And he wrote down not necessarily an equation, but a process by which people can optimize how much to spend or consume, the opposite of it, uh, at every stage in their life. So equation number four is what I call the uh, Fisher equation about how much you should spend. And I contrast it with uh, some of the financial planning rules of thumb. So uh, I guess that's, that's where I would begin. So can you talk about how important it is that retirees have some sort of dynamic or flexible spending strategy? So, I mean, it, to me, it's almost tautological. I, I'm, I'm surprised I have to explain to people how important flexibility is. Like, you know, you should be flexible. No, really, I shouldn't just tie myself to the mastheads and just go. <laughs> no, go. Of course, you need flexibility. So the, the idea of a spending rule, and I want to be very careful here, the, the idea of picking a spending rate at the age of 65 and sticking to that spending rate for the rest of your life, no matter what happens, I mean, it, it, it is ridiculous. It, it, and it should sound ridiculous once it's properly explained. So obviously, you have to be flexible. And you have to adapt to what's happening in the market. So the intelligent approach to spending is you know, my portfolio is down 10%. How much should I adjust my spending? That's the intelligent approach. You know, the markets have been up very strongly. I'm thinking I can probably withdraw a bit more. How do I adjust my, my spending? Markets are up 30%. Can I adjust my spending 30%? No, 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 no. You need a reserve. Vice versa in the other direction. You know, markets are down 20%. Should I reduce my spending 20%? Uh, no, you don't have to because there should be a reserve built in there. So the Obviously, you have to adjust and it has to be dynamic, but to stick to a particular percentage and say, well, no matter what, we're going to continue to withdraw that percentage for the rest of my life as long as I live. I don't even know why you know, we continue to, to push back against it. But uh, to answer your question, Cameron, absolutely flexibility is important. So when you, when you say that in the book, you're, you're, you're comparing something like that with the the rules of thumb in financial planning. Is that things like the 4% yeah. rule? I'm sorry, the what? The 4% rule? Never heard of it. What's the 4% rule? <laughs> okay, perfect. No, no, I'm serious. You d explain to me what the 4% rule is because everybody has their own version of it. It's like in okay, the eye okay, of the okay. beholder. What's your version of the 4% rule? Okay. So the as I understand the genesis of the 4% rule, it came from a guy named William Bengen in I think a 1992 or 1994 paper where he showed that you could have sustainably spent in the in the worst 30-year period in US market history, you could have sustainably spent 4% of, of uh, a portfolio of US stocks and bonds without running out of money. Now, to be clear, th this is a, a rule that Cameron and I have bashed, picked apart, explained why it doesn't make a whole lot of sense many times in the podcast. Uh, but hear, hearing your thoughts, I guess we kind of already heard them. But if you have any specific commentary to my definition of the 4% rule, that would be uh... Benjamin, to be honest, you didn't really describe the 4% rule. So let me let, let me let me break it down. So I come to you with a million dollars yes. and I say, hey, hey, Benjamin, uh, I've heard of this thing called the 4% rule. What does it mean? How much can I spend this year? Yeah, so it, it's it's 4% of the million. Probably okay, broken so how up much would that how much would that be this year? Uh, of the million dollars? Yeah. Well, we're starting with forty thousand dollars in the first year, four percent of, okay. of a million. Uh, and, and, what, and what do I do next year, Benjamin? I want to follow this thing called the four percent rule. What should I do next year? So, based on Bill Bengen's definition, we're going to increase that amount by inflation, that dollar amount, that forty thousand by inflation or or deflation, the following year, and then follow okay. that. And then, what do I do in two years from now? Uh, the same, the same procedure, and rinse and repeat. Okay. And what if the market, you know, doubles in the next year? What do I do? This is one of the issues. We maintain the the same the same path. And and if the market goes down 50%, what do I do? Same same thing. Yeah. See, it's, and and I find that when you sort of break it down like that, you don't have to have a deep conversation about the 4% rule. People nod and say, "Yeah, that really does sound stupid." I would tend to agree with you. I I, I like <laughs> I like the way that you picked it apart though. <laughs> 
Uh, okay. You know, look, I I, I got to be honest. So, you know, I, I was scra- – look, I've been doing this for a while now. I've been teaching for quite a while. And, you know, I remember when this thing caught on. And I'm like, oh, man, that doesn't have legs. They're going to forget about that faster than yesterday's newspaper. Uh, and here we are 25 years later, and it's like a tsunami. I mean, it's crushed me. I, I, you know, I can't even – you know, anywhere I go, we use the 4% rule. Um, so what I've done is I, I actually have implemented into my curriculum in the MBA program at the Schulich School. I teach a course on retirement income models, and I have an entire week. I mean, that's three hours of a you know 12-week course dedicated to the 4% rule. And, uh, you know, I want you to quantify the risks of the 4%. And does it make sense to you? And would an economist advocate for it? And what are the problems? And they got to write an essay on it. So, you know, hopefully the 40 students that graduate from my class will just shake their head and say, there's no damn way I'm ever doing that thing. But who knows, you know? Yeah, that's good. Well, we've we've tried to do our part to tell people why it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, too. Uh, We're still following the the book here. We're we're still on question one. Yeah. Technically, we we've covered a lot of the other. No, I think we're, we we're, we're we're let me let me pull this up here. It's been a while, so I think we're up to chapter uh, five now. That is that is right. It. Paul yeah. Samuelson, the, the God. Yeah, are are we up to that or yes. do we want to? So the, the so just to get a sense of where this is, uh, I believe that there are seven sort of very important concepts that people should know as they transition into retirement. You know, just to recap. Longevity of your money, longevity of human life, what an annuity is worth, how much should I be spending every year? Uh, and then you so when, once you get those very, very important ones down pat, it's about, all right, you know, how do I invest my portfolio? Uh, and in my mind, the sort of champion, the first economist that really, you know, went into it with a very rigorous frame of mind was Paul Samuelson. Uh, Prof- Professor Paul Samuelson was uh, an economist at MIT, you know, God in the field of microeconomics and macroeconomics, Nobel laureate. Uh, I had a chance to actually meet him once at a conference. I, you know, this astonishing man. He uh, came up with this model for how much people should allocate between stocks and bonds. And uh, his response was that, you know, in the absence of human capital, which we can talk about in a moment, uh, it shouldn't change over the course of your life, which was very difficult for many people to accept. What do you mean it shouldn't change over the course of my life? I'm young. I should have more stocks. and I'm old. I should have less stocks. And he said, there's absolutely no basis. There's no mathematical way to get asset allocation to be a function of time. You have to make very, very strict assumptions about what you think the equity risk premium is going to do over time or mean reverting interest rates. But, you know, if you just take a basic stock bond model, you can't get time to matter. And, you know, economists spent, you know, decades trying to push back against it. And he said, no. And, you know, the math supported it. And eventually he conceded and, you know, the industry works in that direction that when you're young, you have a lot of human capital. The human capital acts as a bond so you can have more stocks. Uh, As you get older, your bond is depleted. So, you know, you need to be safer. You put more in bonds. Uh, But the equation in the book, that fifth equation in the book is the mix between stocks and bonds uh, and how that mix is affected by human capital. So that's sort of the main insight there. Uh, I, you, you've also got a book on on this, I believe. So it, it would be great if we could dig a little bit more into the human capital piece and how how someone can think about whether their human capital is a whether they are a stock or a bond, whether their 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 human capital behaves like a stock or a bond. Yeah. So now we're really going through the the, the greatest hits. I feel like Mick <laughs> Jagger going on stage and them yelling at him. No, I want you to sing the 1950s version. That's such a good book. Um, so. I, I wrote a book, um, I keep on saying that, this doesn't sound good, called Are You a Stock or a Bond, uh, which dug into, you know, many years ago, dug into this notion that uh, your job is your biggest investment. So I, I tell my undergraduates especially uh, that they are richer than I am. And they misunderstand that to think that somehow I went bankrupt and I don't have any money, but they have money. I said, no, 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 you are richer than I am because you have this thing called human capital. I'm much older than you and I have much less of that. Human capital is the present value of all the earnings that you're going to be receiving over the course of your life. And, you know, you graduate from a business school these days, it can be in the millions of dollars, you know. COVID aside, you know, what area of the business school, but it's the present value of what you're going to earn. I call it a gold mine. It's an oil well. Uh, You know, if you actually quantify it at today's low interest rate environment, it really is in the millions of dollars, millions of dollars. And, uh, and, And that has to be taken into account when you build your investment portfolio. So when you're young, you have millions of dollars in human capital, relatively safe, depending on what your job is. 
Uh, so it's got to be taken into account. What do I mean by taking into account? So, you know, I'm a university professor. I have a decent pension from the university. If I add up my tenured position and my pension and I present value that, I'm looking at, you know, a couple million dollars in bonds. So I don't own bonds. I haven't owned bonds for many years. Recently, I've slightly tinkered with bonds just a little bit more because I'm getting older biologically, chronologically. So uh, I, I very rarely invested in bonds. Vice versa, my MBA students, uh, many of whom wanted to go become investment bankers, derivative traders, uh, you know, they want to work in the financial services industry. I said, look, your human capital is very risky. Uh, you know, if we go into a bad market or a bad economy, your human capital is going to suffer. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and have your financial capital there as well. So the idea is to, to quantify what your job's asset allocation is before you decide what to do with the rest of your asset allocation. So, you know, when someone comes to me and says, look, I've got $500 in a TFSA, how should I invest it? Uh, and they're 22 years old. I say, it doesn't really matter. You know, what are you doing for your job? What is your living? What, how are you investing? You know, I, I don't mind talking to you about a TFSA, but you know, let's talk about the big asset you've got, you. What are you doing with you? And, and how is you allocated? And, and what's the allocation of you? Oh, you're more stock-like. Well, then maybe more. Just to get people to focus on their human capital, at least as much as they're focusing on their, on their financial capital. That, that was kind of the main message of the book. Are you a stock or a bond? You as in human capital. So I got a question to bolt onto that. If you're human capital and you're young, what are your thoughts on someone younger using leverage to get quicker exposure to more equity? So, you know, to what extent? I mean, are we talking uh, 10 times leveraged ETFs? No. Uh, you know, I don't think those make sense at any point because they're not really leveraged equity. Uh, if it's about borrowing against the house in a tax efficient manner yeah. to invest a little bit more in equity, uh, maybe. But, you know, I, 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 I worry about the psychological cost of these things and how they're going to behave in a panic and whether or not they're going to have a liquidity crisis. So, you know, theoretically, yes. But, you know, that delta uh, shouldn't be more than 50 at the most 70 percent. We're not talking about five times their wealth. No, no, no. Uh, which is what people put into houses, oddly enough. You know, when you buy a house, you take a look at your balance sheet, you're putting 5% down and 95% in a house. That's a, you know, 21 to 1 leverage ratio. Would not recommend that with equities. There, there was a paper and a book from a couple of guys. I'm sure you've, you've, you're have you familiar with it. Um, the Ayers and Nalabuff. Yeah, I know no, I know very, very well. And yeah, uh, okay. Ian Ayers, I mean, I think I even wrote a blurb for their book. Yeah, no, totally into that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it has, they're in the U.S., they teach at Yale. They, they have, it has implications to how you structure their retirement plans, 401k plans. Yeah, look, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, I bought into that. And, you know, when I started investing, so you have to think about my life cycle. So I was in graduate school in the 1990s, and I'm reading Samuelson, and I'm reading Human Capital. And what Cameron just said is what, you know, the light bulb went on 25 years ago. I'm like, you know, I, I only have 50 bucks, but, you know, if I leverage, I can gain the equity risk premium and my human capital is safer. So I did, uh, you know, I leveraged, again, not with, you know, double and triple ETFs, but borrowing, secured borrowing. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, to within reason and, you know, debt can be problematic, uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the life cycle, you know, to do with the you know, decline in markets. You have margin calls, uh, you have a liquidity shock, you have to sell out, uh, you know, the, the, the market goes down 40%. You suddenly say, you know what? I'm out. I, I just can't handle this anymore. Suddenly leverage actually works against you. So if you can put it in an iron box, seal it, put it in a time machine and send it away for 30 years, yeah, it would be a great idea. Yeah, it's, it's really, it, I think it's good for our, our listeners to hear you talk about that because it, it's something that we've we've talked about on our on our podcast in the past and a lot of listeners get really excited about it, kind of the way that you talked about getting excited about it when you first heard about it. Um, but I, th I think the, the the psychological practicalities of it, like, like you're saying, are probably trickier than people think yeah and, and and a lot of people are wondering you know why would i do that i can just buy a house in toronto or vancouver and i can just i do even better it's up 20 percent. tsx is only up 12 so it, it's a conversation that you have to have in the context of their overall portfolio and you know I, I would rather leverage into human capital take out a big loan go to medical school hmm. you know, that's leveraging human capital that, that boy is that payout first of all it's, it's a lot less liquid and i like it Second of all, you know, the yield is more predictable. 
So when people say, should I borrow to invest? My answer is in what? Human capital, big fan. Housing, okay. Oh, something that's marked to market at 4 p.m. every day? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all right, still sticking with your book here and still technically on question number one, uh, financial legacy. So financial legacy, again, uh, you know, it's about the hero that introduced the kind of thing. It's Solomon Hubner, uh, the least known, I find, from the seven people I point to. Uh, he's known in the U.S. and the insurance industry. Uh, he was a professor at Wharton in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Uh, his big thing was life insurance. You know, he was reacting to the very, very disreputable reputation of life insurance. People thought it was a scam. Now, what do you mean I die, they give me a million bucks? How does that work? That, you know, trading in human life. And he explained the rational human life cycle foundations of, and the importance of life insurance. And it wasn't just that he was a fan of life insurance. He was a fan of whole life insurance. You know, not the buy term, invest the difference. He was a fan of permanent life insurance. He was a fan of borrowing against your life insurance policy if you needed to access cash. He was a fan of annuitizing your life insurance at retirement in order to get income for the rest of your life. In the 1940s, 20 years before there was any economist that was even aware of the importance of annuities in a life cycle framework. Uh, and, you know, he was a great professor when you read his you know, accounts of his students talking about him. So he came up sort of with an equation uh, that not necessarily tells us how to value life insurance. That was the actuaries. But to get a sense of how to think about life insurance, the leverage effect within life insurance, uh, to explain to people the multiple. You know, I don't get it. So I only paid $20,000. How did I get a million? It's because other people pay the leverage effect. So he's one of my seven heroes, Solomon Hubner, or otherwise known as Sonny Saul. And one of the equations is about measuring financial legacy, sixth equation. So I wrap it up at number seven. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, you know, the seventh and final equation brings the six together. Uh, the hero there is a fellow called Andrei Nikolaevich Kolmogorov, a Russian mathematician who uh, passed away in 1987. It's actually an interesting story. I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, he was the world's to all extent and purposes, greatest probabilist. You know, you ask any mathematician who studies probability, who's the biggest name in the 20th century? Uh, they'll say Kolmogorov. Kolmogorov came up with the foundation of any Monte Carlo simulation you're running for retirement income planning. You know, when somebody says, well, we ran a Monte Carlo and we found out that this is the probability this event will occur. Somewhere, someplace in there is a partial differential equation, fancy term for equation that Kolmogorov came up with to uh, compute probabilities. Uh, he, he put probability theory on a rigorous foundation. Uh, he, he built uh, probability theory in a way that, you know, Wall Street was using to value mortgage-backed securities and retirement income specialists were pricing annuity. I mean, it, it's, it's everywhere. It's not just in the retirement income field. Uh, his mathematics are at the heart of almost any type of stochastic modeling. Uh, and, you know, if he had a patent on any of this, he, he would have been worth billions because you can't do anything nowadays without Kolmogorov equations. Uh, he was an ardent communist who would be appalled at all the people making money off of his the mathematics, uh, lived in Russia, grew up in, you know, that, that environment. It's all done for the communal good. Uh, he died uh, the day after the stock market crash of 1987, basically today in 1987. Uh, and, um, you know, he, he came up with these equations for how stochastic processes or models are, are put together. And I, I had to give him the credit because he puts it all together. When you're using a, a, a black box or any simulation process to tell your client how long their money's going to last, what's the probability they're going to live, you'll be okay. Your probability of this is a, it's all Komogoro. So he was kind of the final one and uh, give him a lot of credit. It was actually the, a, a lot of fun to uh, to do that chapter because I got to chat with some of his students. Russian mathematician uh, is you know he, he had many R Russian mathematicians who were students. Uh, some of them uh, were teaching at the at the math department at York University. So I you know I would wander over to hear Kolmogorov stories. And at one point I thought I, I'm gonna have a whole book I'm gonna have to fill up with with the stories of this guy. But anyway, he's the seventh and final equation. How, how important do you think that type of analysis is to the retirement planning process? Yeah. You know, I, 
I would say that if you don't understand the assumptions and probability models, you can't really use the results accurately. You know, I, it, it, it drives me nuts sometimes. You know, I'll hear somebody say, with no financial or mathematical training at all, there's a 97% chance you'll be okay according to our simulations. There's a 97% chance, Mrs. Smith, you'll be fine. And then I say, and what about the 3%? What happens in those cases? I say, no, 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 it's 97%. Look, hey, would you get on an airplane when there's a 97% chance you'll arrive on time? There's a 97% chance you'll arrive on time. What about the 3%? I don't arrive at all. I'm not getting on that plane. I arrive five minutes late. All right, big deal. I'll get on the plane. Right, so in, in this whole idea of knowing the alternatives and understanding what it means to build a probability model and what the tails of the distribution look like, what, I, I think they're critical. So uh, I, I, I think that what's happened is, is that the sophistication of the financial tools has exceeded the ability of many of the planners to understand them. So you have people running around spewing numbers without any understanding of how they came about. And it's not good. It's not good. And I think the industry's gotten way ahead of itself. I, I think that the training of financial advisors has to be at a higher level so they understand at least what the assumptions are about what's happening uh, in, in, in some of these reports. And we're starting to see it, financial planning uh, colleges that are hiring PhDs to teach. But uh, so the response to your question, Benjamin, is I, I, you know, even if you're not going to be solving partial differential equations in your retirement daily life, you do have to understand where it comes from and what the assumptions are. Uh, you know, I've been asked many times to audit internal models, especially in the, you know, the software business. And I'm like, so what is your underlying distributional assumptions? And they kind of look at me and I don't know, we, we got it from Ernst & Young. And I'm like, wait, so what is yours? I don't know, some actuary at Sun Life told them. Like, come on, you can't just use a random generator without understanding underlying assumptions. So, that, you know, Kolmogorov is kind of the wake up call. So speaking of the industry in our few remaining moments, uh, can you just talk quickly about what you think about the proliferation of low-cost indexed fund products and the impact they've had on retirement income planning? So, you know, at, at one level, it's good in the sense that, you know, anytime you can democratize investing and make it cheaper for me, I don't have to pay a big commission to buy and sell stock anymore. In fact, I don't have to pay any commission. You have an account on Robinhood. You can trade all day long at, you know, explicitly no cost. Um, I, I think the problem with the, the rush towards indexing is that there's so many different indices and, and we don't really know which indices to select. So when somebody says to me, I'm 100% passive to what? Uh, the index. Which one? Uh, the S&P 500. And then you tell them, yeah, you, you do understand that, you know, there's ETH, there's there's uh, there's obviously uh, emerging market. You know, there, there's more indices now than there are uh, securities. Literally, I'm, I'm not joking. You can actually find more indices than, you know, actively traded securities. So it's a, it's a good movement. Things are cheaper. It's easier to invest. It's easier to diversify. Diversification is obviously the way to go. But, uh, you know, we, we need to understand a little bit more about, you know, the nature of the indices and, and, and the limited ability of certain indices to really capture the entire market. I think there's a role for active management, if that's what you're asking. You know, should we all be passively invested? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, and in certain markets, the, the evidence seems to suggest that active investing works. And, uh, you know, obviously large cap North American equity, you know, good luck finding alpha. But, you know, if you specialize in, you know, small venture capital deals in, in you know, Singapore, uh, there is no index there. So I don't know if that's what you were asking, Cameron, but cheap is good. Democratization of investing is good. But, uh, you know, you shouldn't be 100 percent index. You should not, especially considering the human capital story. Right. So wait, let me get this straight. You work at Morgan Stanley. Don't have any Morgan Stanley in your portfolio. You're 100 percent human capital is in that. So at the very least, you got to unwind. Oh, you work for Coca-Cola. You know, you, you can't have consumer discretionaries in your retirement plan because if Coke goes down, you're so at the very least, we need active management to disentangle the portion that's in your human capital at the very least. Right. So you don't necessarily mean active management from the perspective of stock picking and, and market timing, which is what I think people tend to think about. Yeah, look, I, I, I think that there's a value to that to keep people engaged and interested. You know, it's, it's fun. You know, we want to make it fun. I, I, the kids that go into finance, I mean, I've been teaching for a long The kids that go into finance is because they love stock pick, picking. The last thing you want to do is to take a third-year business student 
who's in your class taking finance because they always loved the stock market and just hammer into them, you idiot, you, it should all be passive. You're wasting your time. They're going to go become an accountant. We don't want that. We want them to stay in finance, right? You should send them a- you, right? you, you have to build on their excitement for the market and, and this notion that they will find some undiscovered gem and, and, and they'll be able to ferret out value. You have to build on that or else you're, you know, you're going to kill the field. So let, let's nurture that. Let's explain to them the limitations of that. Let's work with it. But, you know, to t- teach everybody, no, 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 100% indices, go home. It's not, it's not viable. And it's not, it, it's not correct. I, I, I don't think it's correct. I, I think it, it's complacent. It, it turns, people become lazy. They don't understand why they're owning things. So um, I, I, I think there's some value in all of those with a limit of your portfolio, obviously. You know, I'm mm. you know, 85% index to, you know, the Morgan Stanley Capital International Index. End of story. You can you can send your students a link to my YouTube channel. I think I've made uh, I think I've made index investing cool. I think. All right. You know, you, you can check it out. The question is, what do we tell them first? Right. If you're if you're reluctant to take a finance course because it scares and intimidates you, I have those. I teach a personal finance course. Most of the students say, this is the only finance course I'm taking. I'm intimidated by it. I'm confused by it. You're absolutely right. The first thing we talk about is indices. I don't even go into stock picking. That That's a different clientele. They're the mm-hmm. ones that you say, no, 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 don't mess with this thing. Just buy an index and go home. Get on with your life. I'm talking about the other group. I'm talking to people that are getting the CFA designations. They're challenging level one, level two, level three, and they're going to go out and they're going to be managing portfolios how much do we hammer into them? Oh, you're wasting your time. It's all passive from now on. You'll never find alpha. It, it's a dangerous, volatile mix. If, you, if you're too successful with that, they're like, so why am I even going into finance? Hmm. My, my views, my views. Just Appreciate the guy it. a bar, right? I mean, it's not, you know, academia's view. My view. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. Last question in our meeting a minute or so here. Uh, something yeah. we always ask our guests. So, Professor, how do you define success in your life? How do I define success in my life? Boy, I don't even know what equation to start with on that one. How do I, <laughs> um, how do I define success in my life? I'm not, can I get back to you on that? I mean, that, you, you just floored me. Success is wanting to wake up in the morning. You know, the alarm rings and you're like, oh, man, great. Let's get going enjoying what you do, wanting to continue doing it. I, I try not to have milestones of success. I, I try not to say, you know, I can't wait till I do that because that'll be success. I, I don't like that. I like, you know, smooth, I, I like smooth consumption. I don't like, you know, defining success by reaching. As soon as I get to Everest, that's it. I climbed Everest, I'm done. Uh, it's about finding projects that excite you and continuing. To, success to me is, am I still excited about what I'm doing? And if I'm not, change what you're doing, find something else, which is why I like to change research over time as well. Uh, I, I find that, you know, I like that. I enjoyed it. Now it's time to move on to something else because I, uh, I'm i done with that. So I have no idea whether I'm answering your question. I'm just, you know, stumbling for time here. It was an ama- amazing answer and you've had amazing energy and we appreciate that. And it's been great to, to get to meet you and introduce you to our listeners. So thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. I appreciate it. And thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, my books. You know, I, I do a lot of, uh, you know, speaking and you know, podcasts, certainly. And they always warn me, do not mention your books. It's not professional. So I'm always like I put them in the back so that, you know, people can see it, but I don't talk about them. So thank you for the opportunity to actually talk about it. And I'm actually quite proud of the Seven Equations book, uh, to be honest. Uh, it, for some reason, it's the one that sold the best from all the other ones I've written. Really? I, I can't quite understand. I can't quite understand why. No, I really don't. I mean, it's mad. more than more than pensionize and stock oh, yeah. or bond. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I know. I get the royalty statement. In fact, uh, funny story. So, in the first few books that I wrote, I <laughs> asked my daughters to write poems for the book. So, I have four daughters, and my four daughters wrote four uh, poems for four separate books that I had written. And the idea was the the deal was that they would get five percent of the royalties for the poem that they wrote. That would be sort of their compensation. And it's a constant source of fighting in my family that my daughter, who wrote the poem for <laughs> Seven Equations, gets so much more than the other three, and they don't. It's not fair, Daddy. And then, I don't know. The book sells. I got. I, we have we have 
two minutes. I know you, I know you have a hard start at three. Sure. Uh, yeah, you, you, you said that you've, you've liked to change research over time. We, we've talked yeah. a lot about the, the books that you've written and the research that you're well known for around annuities and things yeah. like that. Just real quick, even if you just name the field, what are other areas of research that you're passionate about that people may not know about as much? So, so I've just published, all right, here we go. Let's plug some more. So I've just published a book called Retirement Income Recipes in R, which is a textbook that I'm using to teach. It's a very technical book on how to use R, which is a language similar to Python, to do retirement income computations. Very technical, very heavy. Uh, I am done with technical stuff for a while. My current interests are history, financial and economic history. So I'm spending a lot of time in the 16th and 17th century trying to understand how the financial markets that we rely on today began. What was the asset allocation of a retiree in 1650? How did somebody invest in the year 1720? Where did people get income from in the Middle Ages? How did they build portfolios during the plague? And I mean the 13th and 14th century, not the current plague. So I'm fascinated right now by history wow. within the context of how people manage their financial affairs. How did wealthy people manage their financial affairs? I mean, people had money then. You know, It's not like we all suddenly got money 100 years ago. They were a very, very wealthy people. How did they diversify? How did they invest? What did they do? What did they do? That's what interests me now. And if you ask me, what's my next book going to be about in two, three years, whenever, it's going to be Asset Allocation in 1697. Oh, I can't wait to read it. Wow, can't wait amazing. to read it. All right. We're out of time. Moshe, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. You are very welcome. Good luck to you folks. And I appreciate the opportunity. Stay well. Thank you. Yeah.